Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bassam Haddad. I'll be uh, conducting this um, basically teach-in with uh, Omar Shakir and Julia Marini, who is yet to join us. She has uh, been held up with her work uh, right now, but we are hoping that you'll be able to join us. This is uh, Gaza in Context, uh, which is basically a, a collaboration of uh, teach-ins among 22 university organizations, uh, centers, uh, research centers, and so on. This is the third teach-in installment for Gaza and Context. Uh, we had an intro intro to Gaza, Gaza 101, and then Gaza and History. And this teach-in is titled Human Rights Gaza and the War on Palestine. This is the third teach-in again. Uh, it will address the humanitarian ramifications of Israel's three-week assault on Gaza as the death toll and destruction continue to mount. The speakers will examine the nature and consequences of this current round of collective punishment imposed on Palestinians in Gaza, the broader history of the 16-year siege and beyond, and the everyday conditions of those trying to survive there, with today being a markedly um, horrific day in terms of the death toll and the recent uh, bombardment uh, of the Jabalia refugee camp. Uh, welcome, Omar. How are you? I'm okay. As okay as one can be during, given the circumstances. Ahlan wa sahlan. Um, we will hope that uh, Julia can join us, uh, but uh, let me introduce Omar uh, first, and we will uh, start with Omar and then move forward uh, with uh, some of uh, my questions and people can actually ask questions on, on YouTube or uh, Facebook and we will definitely work to uh, collect them and uh, post them to our speakers. Um, Omar Shakir is or serves as the Israel and Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch, where he has authored several major reports, including a 2021 report comprehensively documenting how Israeli authorities are committing crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution against Palestinians. As a result of his advocacy, the Israeli government deported Omar in November 2019. He has also covered Egypt for Human Rights Watch, represented men detained in Guantanamo Bay, and co-authored a report on U.S. drone strikes in Afghanistan. Omar, there is more to talk about than we can in the next uh, 75 minutes or so. But if you would uh, please uh, share with us um, your thoughts on what has been transpiring in Gaza. And then we will move to a conversation style unless Julia joins us because she did... Um, prepare an update on what's happening in Gaza. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Bassam, for hosting this. And, and I think it's very important for the Jizalia and wider community. Um, you know, Julia works for El Mizan, uh, one of the Palestinian human rights organizations based in Gaza. So I'm sure she's um, very much caught up uh, with that perspective. But, um, you know, I'm sure for this audience, the basic facts of what's transpiring are probably known, but I thought maybe we could start by just grounding, you know, how things are looking, um, you know, as we speak. Um, obviously, the most significant development in recent days has been the intensification of Israel's operations um, in the Gaza Strip. Um, we've seen an, an intensification of its bombardment campaign. Um, we've seen thousands of bombs dropped across Gaza, including the use of explosive weapons with wide area effects. That is a type of weapon which, when used in densely populated areas, causes foreseeable uh, clear damage to civilians and really risks indiscriminate attacks. And that's exactly uh, what we're seeing on the ground in Gaza. Entire blocks, entire large parts of neighborhoods. I mean, this Jabalia strike, again, we're still looking at the facts, but you're talking about, you know, multiple um, craters in a very densely populated refugee camp. Um, this has caused um, significant civilian death. The numbers being reported by the Gaza Health Ministry are more than 8,500 Palestinians that have been killed, including, um, you know, thousands of children, including, uh, you know, uh, many, many uh, hundreds, thousands of civilians. Um, it's important to note that beyond just the scale of this bombardment, there's nowhere safe uh, in Gaza to go. Uh, Human Rights Watch has documented Israel's use of white phosphorus, um, which can cause incendiary burns, can burn structures and homes. 
Um, this has been documented not just in Gaza, but also along the Lebanese-Israeli border. Amnesty International has reached similar conclusions. It's important to note that international humanitarian law investigations of legality of airstrikes can often take time. That's the nature of how it looks. But Israel has a very clear track record of committing war crimes, um, as do Palestinian armed groups, I should note. Um, those include strikes that we've documented over the years that are indiscriminate, disproportionate, that wipe away entire families with no apparent military target, that destroy high-rise buildings full of homes and businesses, again, with no apparent military target in sight. During prior ground invasions, Human Rights Watch has documented the killings of civilians, including those fleeing areas. There are already concerning reports um, are along these lines. And obviously, um, it is precisely the scale um, of intense bombardment that has led many, many to call for a ceasefire. Beyond just the bombardment, um, you have a reality again where the civilian population has now been for three weeks uh, plus without electricity and without, um, for the most part, without water. Now, Israel controls the infrastructure networks into Gaza. It could literally flip a switch um, and electricity and water would return. Again, there's been significant damage to the infrastructure in Gaza, so it's not quite that direct, but the electricity would help with pumping water, etc. In addition, since October 21st, a trickle of humanitarian aid has been allowed in through Egypt, but it's woefully insufficient to meet the needs of Gaza's civilian population. 80% of Gaza's population before October 7th relied on um, uh, humanitarian uh, aid and um, and what was entering Gaza before October 7th, you know, the 20 trucks a day, the average until the last couple of days, that's less than 4% of that overall um, figure. So we have a reality now where aid, medicine, food are not being allowed in. So hospitals are operating, are overwhelmed, over capacity, um, barely operational. Israel has ordered all 13 hospitals in northern Gaza to be evacuated. There are hundred, there are, you know, tens of thousands, more than 100 uh, thousand displaced people being held in these medical facilities. Um, these facilities have been struck, hit in airstrikes um, over uh, recent days. Um, and again, it's important to note that men, these are all, you know, th these consist of war crimes, collective punishment, the denial of life-saving humanitarian aid. Those are war crimes under the laws of war. And it's important to note that the attacks, you know, committed by Palestinian armed groups on October 7th, deliberately killing civilians, taking civilians as hostage. Those are war crimes also, but you know, atrocities and war crimes committed by one actor does not justify those committed by uh, other actors. And it's also important to note that obviously the story doesn't start um, on October 7th. And I think that's the point of the series. Um, Israel has been imposing a closure on the Gaza Strip for more than 16 years. That's unlawful. It includes sweeping restrictions on the movement of people and goods. Uh, for 50 plus years, 56 plus years, the people of Gaza have lived under an occupation characterized by systematic rights abuse. Palestinians in Gaza um, face systematic oppression. That's a part of the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution that the Israeli government imposes on Palestinians. And on top of all that, most of Gaza's population are refugees who have been denied for more than 70 years the right to return to their homes. So to sum up, no electricity, largely no water, um, you know, trickle of aid coming in, relentless aerial bombardment that's wreaking havoc, that's led to, you know, I didn't even mention that the majority of the population has been displaced um, from, the, from, from their homes. So many have been displaced multiple times, 1.4 million, nearly half have had their homes damaged or destroyed. Um, and we have the ground invasion that's begun. So really, it's a level of violence that's un unprecedented in the modern history of Israel-Palestine. At the same time, we're seeing, uh, which I'll, I'll end on in the West Bank, also unprecedented violence and repression. Um, that was happening before October 7th uh, in 2023 and 2022, and has continued at even more of an escalated rate since. I'll stop there, Bassam. Thank you, Omar. Uh... You have done so much work on uh, a variety of uh, topics. I actually have a huge list having to do with international law, having to do with the uh, relatively recent consensus on the question of apartheid uh, being basically the operating formula in Israel-Palestine. 
uh, questions on the uh, questions of civilians and casualties. Um, let me start with with the with the most egregious and uh, horrific uh, figure, and that is uh, more than eight thousand five hundred civilian casualties. Palestinians have been killed, not died, killed. Now, uh, what? Uh, where does international law stand on the question of uh, such civilian uh, casualties? Uh, is is it still uh, something that uh, Israel can write off as collateral damage? Uh, international humanitarian law makes assessments of legality based on particular strikes. So it's not necessarily based on an overall casualty number, right? And that's part of what makes um, legal assessments. And legal assessments may not be the most important thing in the moment when you have this scale of civilian devastation. Um, uh, it's based on certain factors, right? So you, you, strikes need to be proportionate. So any loss, including to civilians, must be proportionate to the military gain um, that's that's achieved. There, there must be a principle of discrimination. So you cannot have indiscriminate strikes that um, are not distinguishing between civilians and combatants. There is prohibition on use of certain types of weapons that cause uh, extra harm to individuals. Um, so civilian casualties are certainly an important indication of illegality, but on its own, again, with, through a legal analysis, you know, do, you know, don't lead to a direct determination. That said, there are important principles that are relevant here, right? So, for example, um, there is a, a declaration that's been signed by over 80 states that prohibits the use of explosive weapons. So, like, um, you know. Uh, aerial uh, bombs of a certain degree of intensity, certain kinds of artillery in densely populated areas, because doing so causes foreseeable harm to civilians, especially when we're talking about Gaza, 25 by 7 miles, 2.2 million uh, people that have been killed, uh, uh, sorry, that live there. And, you know, um, and that's the population of which we've seen more than 8,500 people killed. So civilian, the short answer is civilian casualties as an overall number does not lead to an automatic assessment of legality. That said, you know, it certainly indicates um, that there is significant evidence of potentially indiscriminate or disproportionate strikes. And when you take into account the weapons Israel's using, when you look at its track record that I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, you know, certainly um, the, the evidence is, is all indications are that we, we're seeing a continuation um, of these trends. Thank you, um, Omar. Uh, Julia just uh, called and she will be joining us shortly. Um, so I hope that uh, we will be able to bring her into the conversation. Um, if you can, in the meantime, uh, tell us... Uh, more broadly, uh, based on the foregoing uh, and based on the fact that Human Rights Watch was one of the pioneering organizations that uh, uh, began to address the question of apartheid uh, recently uh, as Israel's formula of, of, of rule in, in Palestine. How does this uh, uh, fit into the, uh, into the uh, how does Gaza fit into the apartheid framework considering uh, some of the uh, facts such as the uh, siege on the one hand, but the pullout of Israeli troops uh, 16 years ago while still controlling every aspect of life. Thanks, Ms. Sam. And I would just make a quick correction that, you know, it's Palestinian advocates, scholars, and others who have been the pioneers on, on the apartheid work. You know, we, we came in relatively late compared to them. But I, we, we, you and I had a, you and I had a podcast before, and, and I asked you that question, but I'm talking within the human rights organizations human rights. frameworks. Enough. Yeah. Fair enough. But I just want to be clear because I know some of those might be listening and on this call. But um, look, Bassam, I think it's a really important question because, you know, um, it's undeniable that the systematic oppression of the people of Gaza reflect the Israeli government's crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. So you mentioned the withdrawal of Israeli uh, ground forces and settlers in 2005. Under international law, and this is an determination echoed by the UN, by the Red Cross, Israel remains the occupying power in Gaza because it retains control over the airspace, 
the water space, the infrastructure, the electricity, the water. It controls the movement of people and goods. It controls uh, the population registry that issues IDs. It controls taxation. It controls most everyday aspect of movement between Gaza and the West Bank. So even if someone leaves through Egypt, they can't enter the West Bank, even though Gaza and the West Bank are a single territorial unit. And our research at Human Rights Watch indicates that the way the Israeli government justified that decision in 2005, and by the way, not just justified it then, but the way the policy has manifested itself in the nearly two decades since indicates that they see Gaza, they treat it essentially as a demographic receptacle. So to take Palestinians in a small territory off the demographic books, to use an American political science term, gerrymandering, right? So in essence, getting them off the demographic books and consolidating a Jewish majority across Israel and the West Bank that it hopes to retain. And that underlies the overarching Israeli government policy to, to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians, which is a part of its apartheid. El Mizan, the organization Julia works for, published a report called the Gaza Bantistan. And in essence, it talks about how, how to see Gaza as in essence, another area A in the West Bank as part of a larger strategy between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, where Israel seeks to maximize control of the land and confine Palestinians to smaller and smaller enclaves. The other point I want to make, Bassam, is that um, a part of Israel's apartheid undoubtedly is its use of decades long use of excessive disproportionate force. Um, and it, it's rooted in a devaluing of Palestinian life. And what you're seeing in the Gaza Strip uh, exemplifies that reality um, of, of killing Palestinians, of disregarding um, their life. And that's obviously a core part of Israel's apartheid and persecution. And since Julia joined the room, I will, I will stop there because El Mizan has really been the pioneers on the, how Gaza fits into apartheid analysis. Good afternoon, Julia, how are you? Hi, thank thank you, and sorry for the confusion. I'm I'm okay. No, we 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 understand the circumstances you're in, and we are very delighted that you are joining us. We would love to hear from you uh, about the uh, some of the updates that you want to share with us. But I'd like to introduce you very quickly, if you don't mind. Um, so Julia Marini, who just joined us, works as International Advocacy Officer for El Mizan Center for Human Rights, a Palestinian organization based in Gaza. Her expertise ranges from conflict accountability to migration justice. She holds an LLM in International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights from the Geneva Academy. Welcome again, Julia. And uh, the floor is yours. We already discussed a few uh, topics. Uh, Omar addressed uh, the current situation, though we would like to hear more detail from you from uh, the Gaza-based uh, human rights organization. And we also addressed the question of uh, uh, the extent to which international law uh, how international law deals with uh, the, the killing of civilians and whether they can still be considered, as we have seen in various wars, uh, collateral damage and the question of proportionality. And then um, Omar uh, addressed the, uh, uh, the apartheid framework and how it operates on God, in Gaza. And I understand that you have done quite a bit of work on the Bantu stands, so maybe we could get to that later. But we'd love to start with a uh, a quick update from you uh, from the ground, given that today was was a pretty uh, exceptionally horrific day. Yeah. Um, so right before before you started, um, there have been reports of a huge um, massacre of Palestinians in in Jabalia, um, in in the refugee camp that was reportedly uh, targeted by Israeli airstrikes, um, and so far I think that. The, there are estimates of hundreds of, of casualties. Um, this the situation on the ground, it's it's very dire. Um, I spoke with a colleague a few days ago that told me, you know, if you don't like if we are alive, it's because we're lucky, right? Because the way Israel has been bombing Gaza, it's a way that it, it, they, they've been carpet bombing Gaza, completely disregarding um, basic principle of international law, uh, specifically the principle of distinction. Um, and he was telling me how, again, if whether you are dead or alive, it's just a matter of luckiness rather than than anything else. Um, and how, however, as lucky as you can be to surviving airstrikes, uh, um, 
starvation doesn't inspire anyone. And uh, now we're, we, are, we are in a situation in Gaza where uh, people have basically no more access to food or, or drinking water. Um, there are queues at the bakeries that uh, can be hours and hours to, to literally just get a few pieces of bread. Um, the situation of, of water, it's, it's terrifying. Um, even before this all started, 97% uh, of Gaza water was considered to be undrinkable. Um, I'm hearing reports of people, children, pregnant women drinking salty water from the sea. Uh, I think that we are all seeing pictures of Palestinians literally washing themselves and their clothes in the Mediterranean Sea, um, where, however, there have been like, the sea was just been dumped in. So uh, <laughs> there is a, also a looming um, sanitary crisis, and I think that the WHO itself warned about the possible spread of of diseases among um, the civilian population. Um, I would say that as of now, I'm very, very worried of, of the situation in the north of Gaza, where currently three of my colleagues have decided to, to stay. Um, they were unable or unwilling to follow the, the evacuation order issued by, by the Israeli military over, well, the multiple uh, warnings issued by, by the Israeli military over the past few weeks. And I think that what we saw today with the uh, kind of advan advancement of, of Israel ground operation in, in Gaza is that uh, the north of Gaza is slowly going to become isolated from, from, from the south. It's going to be very unlikely that humanitarian aid will ever reach the, the north of Gaza. And this is particularly worrying because the most important medical complex of the entire strip are in Gaza City, especially Al Shifa and Al Quds Hospital, but also the Turkish friend Chita Hospital, which was targeted, I believe, yesterday or earlier this morning, which is the only uh, hospital in Gaza that actually offers some basic treatment to, to cancer patients. Um, and again, the, what, what we are seeing on the ground is that it's somehow the materialization of statements that have been done by Israeli high officials over the past few weeks, right? So that they consider, you know, everyone in Gaza to be to be a target. Um, in one of the evacuation or in the evacuation order issued on the uh, on the 21st of October, um, in the leaflets dropped in the north of Gaza, uh, the Israeli military said that whoever stays in the north of Gaza and doesn't follow the evacuation order would be considered an accomplice to, to a terrorist organization, which in other words means that it would be seen as a person that can be targeted, which of course is wrong because people should be considered civilians unless proven, proven otherwise. And I think that even this morning emerged some videos of a, a Palestinian car uh, being targeted by, by an Israeli tank without even, you know, assessing whether the people driving the car were, were civilians or, or not. Um, and um, another great, great concern is that of, of humanitarian aid and the fact that over the past 10 days, the number of humanitarian trucks of humanitarian aid that entered Gaza, it's largely uh, insufficient. I think that the UN relief chief said that the bare minimum number of trucks to counter uh, the current emergency in Gaza is at least the 100 trucks. And, um, and we have seen that I think not even 200 trucks enter Gaza in 10 days. So, and again, whatever aid entered Gaza, it didn't include fuel, which is essential for, run, uh, for running hospitals, but also to pump water into into people's home uh, for electricity to, to work and for the Gaza power plant to work. Uh, and, and again, the fact that none of this aid has been delivered in, in the north of Gaza. So we, 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 have, we have major concern about the faith of people that decided or were unable to, to evacuate from, from north Gaza. Thank you, um, Julia. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about a little bit more about the situation of hospitals and fuel and medicine uh, and all sorts of really essential, uh, uh, it, whether it's equipment or whether it's medicine that is helping or needs to be there to help and allow for uh, the injured to be treated properly? We are seeing and hearing and watching 
uh, really horrific scenes about with kids, children, um, whereby there's no anesthetic and they're they're being they're being uh, treated in 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 ways that are, uh, I mean, simply horrific. Uh, w w what is the quest the issue uh, here, and to to what extent? Can there be uh, exceptions made regarding uh, these sorts of supplies, or 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 is there an effort to to do this? Because we keep hearing that within X number of days or hours, everything's going to run out. And so, so how how do we make sense of 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 how people are being treated? Um, yes. So let's go a little bit. Let's dive a bit deep into how Gaza's system works. So even before the, the 7th of October, we have always always said that uh, Gaza healthcare system was on the brink of collapse. Um, many medical devices uh, cannot and couldn't enter Gaza because of closure policies. Uh, hospitals were basically always uh, uh, on the lacking some essential um, drugs to treat to treat patients uh, and even doctors in Gaza couldn't even access you know trainings uh, or classes abroad um, because of the closure policy so we, we already had um, an healthcare system that was already not f functioning properly because of Israeli policies um, because well, even before the 7th of October, Gaza was already lacking um, a permanent supply of energy. Um, the population lived with an average of 8-12 hours of energy, which meant that many civilian structures that need to operate on a 24-7 basis, such as hospitals, have their own generators uh, that run on fuel. Um, and the fact that fuel hasn't entered Gaza since the 5th of October, because crossings are closed on the weekend, um, means that basically they are slowly running out of, of fuel to, to operate. And that, of course, implies that they will no longer be able to perform basic services for the population and especially the people that are injured because I think that there are at least 20,000 people that have been injured since the 7th of October. Um, there is a lack of, there is a shortage of, of medical supplies and especially uh, anesthesia. So there have been reports of uh, uh, surgery being performed with without anesthesia. Um, I've heard of C-section being performed without uh, anesthesia um, or people performing surgery on the hallway of, of, of hospitals because the surgery rooms are overcrowded. Um, there are no lights sometimes. So I've seen pictures of people using the lights of their phone to, to perform surgeries. Um, and again, we are particularly worried about people under intensive care units that need briefing machine to, to survive, including 130 premature babies that are currently literally surviving uh, through briefing machines. Um, and of course, this is something that it's impossible to estimate, but we also need to need to assess the fact that there are thousands of Palestinians that have perhaps cancer patients or that have other diseases that cannot be treated as they would be treated in normal days, right? So there is these all unaccounted numbers of people that are likely dying because they cannot access treatments that would have otherwise been available unless the healthcare system was, you know, focusing on the uh, on the injured and that of, of the current round of hostilities. Um, and as I mentioned before, we, we are particularly concerned of cancer patients. So uh, cancer patients usually would receive treatments in hospital outside of Gaza, because in Gaza there is no oncology treatment. Uh, the only hospital that provides some treatment for cancer patients is the Turkish uh, in, uh, Friendship Hospital, which again has been recently targeted. Um, and these people normally would have been referred to hospitals in East Jerusalem or around the West Bank or in Israel proper. Uh, but of course now uh, there is no more permit system. Um, so um, that's also something that is concerning and it, it's really hard to, to account for those deaths. Um, and of course, not to mention that the lack of fuel also uh, has a severe impact on the um, 
provision of essential services like ambulances and civil defense team. So one of the reasons why there are thousands of people reported under the rubble is because civil defense teams uh, don't have fuel to run their, their cars and go and save people. And the same for ambulances. Not to mention that, of course, the fact that paved roads in Gaza have been bombed and destroyed doesn't help uh, them in, you know, fulfilling their, their duty and, and their role. Um, again, something that I said before is that we're particularly concerned about the fact that so far humanitarian aid only reached the south of Gaza, while the biggest hospital and especially Al Shifa, which is Gaza's biggest hospital and the most equipped to, to face uh, uh, or at least to give some relief to, to, the, to the wounded and sick is in Gaza City and, um, and the fact that it could be targeted at any moment uh, um, gives, uh, uh, well, should warn the international community as a whole, especially because hospitals in the north of Gaza have been currently used as shelter by, by people that have nowhere else to go, uh, as most of the um, UN-run shelters are already overcrowded and cannot host any more people. M many people have are using hospitals as, as shelter. So the situation, it's, uh, it's very dire. Absolutely. Um, can you please uh, share with us before we go back to uh, a couple of other questions about international law and accountability? Um, can you share with us uh, your uh, take on uh, some of the work you've done on the question of apartheid and Bantu stands uh, as they apply to Palestine, but especially to Gaza? And if there's something we can uh, sort of gain in terms of contextualizing what's happening today, because so much of the uh, talk about what's going on, sort of uh, as we all shared and we keep sharing, sort of uh, selects a, an arbitrary, not an arbitrary, like a particular time in history where history started, uh, which is a few weeks ago on October 7th. So if we can just, if we can zoom out and give us a bit of a background on these matters. Yeah, sure. Um, so Al-Mizan has a very specific mandate, um, which is to monitor the human rights situation in the Gaza Strip. So when we decided to um, investigate how Israel's apartheid is visited upon Palestinians in Gaza, we, we decided to actually take a step back and uh, trying to understand how apartheid works. So our conclusion is that Israel's apartheid against the Palestinians, against the Palestinian people, takes place within a wider context of settler colonialism. Um, it's not, it's, it's a policy, it's a regime that affects Palestinians everywhere in the world, wherever they are. And one of the key characteristics of Israel's apartheid is the fact that of, you know, seeking to separate and divide uh, Palestinians into different legal and geographical domains. And I think that that's the key to read Israel's apartheid because the idea is that every single Palestinian is affected by it, but they are affected in a very different way depending on where they live and which ID they hold, right? So for instance, we believe that denying refugees the right of return it's part and parcel of Israel's apartheid. We believe that Palestinians that hold Israeli citizenship are also affected by Israel's apartheid, as well as Palestinians that live in the West Bank, in occupied East Jerusalem, and in Gaza. But again, they are all, uh, the way they live apartheid, it's very different. And our, our analysis is that the closure and blockade of Gaza, it's been the key tool uh, uh, that Israel has employed to impose an apartheid regime against Palestinians in Gaza. Um, uh, Al-Mizan has produced a report which is called the Gaza Bantustan, uh, in which we thoroughly analyze how Israeli policies against Palestinians in Gaza meet the, meet the threshold of the crime of apartheid under the Apartheid Convention. Um, and I invite you all to read the report uh, that's, uh, on which we have been working literally for, for years, uh, trying to also fill the gap, right? Because I think that it's sometimes it's 
um, the way apartheid is, is done is to is to compare the treatments of two groups. Um, and in Gaza, of course, it's 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 different because there are no there are no settlements anymore, at least. Um, but again, um, we believe that the closure and again, as Omar was saying, the complete disregard for civilian life that we have seen throughout the six past round of hostilities of Israel uh, in Gaza um, are all part and parcels of a system of oppression and domination that under international law is also defined as, as the crime of apartheid. Omar uh, and Julia, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, international law and human rights, uh, considering that uh, a lot of people are wondering how how important is human rights law given the uh, the repeated and and uh, egregious violations we are witnessing. And the flip side of this would be what kind of mechanisms exist to actually hold Israel accountable for its violation of uh, international law during this offensive uh, is 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 it something that uh, is it something that uh, is going to simply fade away as a function of the power that uh, Israel and its supporters, specifically the United States, have? Would you like me to go ahead, Bassam? Yes, please. Yeah, so look, I mean, there are, um, understandably, you know, all of us are outraged that victims of serious human rights abuse in, in, in Palestine and Israel have faced a wall of impunity for decades. That's a key reason why we're seeing uh, the atrocities that are taking place on the ground right now. We do, though, have a unique moment now where there are actually existing mechanisms. These didn't exist, several of them didn't exist before or exist in different formats or in different stages that are now there. I'll point to several. One is obviously the International Criminal Court, which um, in 2021 opened uh, a formal investigation of serious crimes committed in Palestine. Uh, the prosecutor just in recent days has made clear that his office has the jurisdiction um, to look into, I mean, that was already upheld by the court, but that they are looking at not only, the, you know, the, not only, you know, current events, but obviously it's important they look at the larger context against which they take place. I think this, it was an important step by the prosecutor to have given a press conference um, at, at the Rafah crossing with, uh, with Gaza. So the International Criminal Court today has the jurisdiction to issue arrest warrants and to move forward. Obviously, there are legal, there are political, there are procedural uh, challenges that this investigation will face. Um, but in many ways, this investigation is a test of the international community's commitment to the principle of accountability uh, and holding to account perpetrators of serious abuse wherever they commit crimes. There is an opportunity there. It's important that states in their statements issue support for the IC investigation. I think it's important that uh, the, uh, that the prosecutor moves forward um, and, and accelerates this investigation in serious crimes committed in or from Palestine. Secondly, we have the International Court of Justice, which in December was requested to issue an advisory opinion on the legal consequences of Israel's prolonged occupation and the repression of Palestinians. Um, states have made submissions um, before the initial deadline. There were more than 50 states and intergovernmental organizations. The court has announced that oral proceedings will begin in early February. Um, that's an important opportunity to issue guidance on legal principles. That's not a forum for accountability, but it could be an important um, avenue for strengthening some of the legal uh, underlying law prohibitions, underscoring, highlighting their significance. And finally, there's a commission of inquiry that was created after the last significant round of hostilities in 2021 that has a mandate to look at um, uh, serious abuses, human rights abuses, but also repression based on group identity on both sides of the green line. They have issued several reports. They also have made clear that they are going to be looking at uh, recent events, and that could be an important avenue both to collect uh, information evidence, but also to help prepare the way for accountability. So just to summarize, I mean, there we are all outraged and frustrated that, you know, decades of systematic repression, unlawful attacks and apartheid and persecution and unlawful killings have been met by impunity. Um, ultimately, there are, you know, political challenges that are coming up in the way, but there are 
outlets available and the that in it's a the, you know whether or not they move forward and how they move forward and what they say and do will be a true test of the international community's resolve and a failure here will have ramifications that reverberate far beyond Israel Palestine Sorry, um, Julia, can you, uh, I was just unmuting, uh, can you uh, share with us your take on, 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 the, on the same question? Yeah. Well, while I, I'm convinced that because of the level of atrocities that we're seeing on the ground, Gaza should be the focus of our attention, I would also to like to zoom out a little bit and also underline that Honestly, over the past three weeks, uh, I don't think there has been one human rights of Palestinians uh, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River that hasn't been violated by Israeli authorities, uh, military or, or institutions. So, of course, in Gaza, we see clear violation of the most basic human rights. Uh, first and foremost, the right to life, but also the right to food, the right to water, the right to health. But we shouldn't forget what's happening in the West Bank where uh, over 100 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli settlers and soldiers. Communities have been displaced from their home. Uh, people have been detained. The number of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jail has doubled over the past three weeks, mostly uh, because of the uh, arbitrary and unlawful arrests of over 4,000 um, Palestinians from Gaza that have used to hold out work permits into, into Israel. And also, if we look at the situation inside the Green Line, we can see that uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel are essentially uh, deprived of their right to be Palestinians, are they, as they cannot even show solidarities for, for their own people being killed in, in Gaza and cannot exercise their basic rights to freedom of assembly or freedom of expression. Um, I think that we got to this point uh, um, because Israel has been granted blanket impunity for all of these violations uh, uh, that haven't just begun on the 7th of October, but have begun decades ago. Um, as Omar was saying, there are existing accountability mechanisms at the international level, including the UN Commission. I believe it's the it's the most comprehensive one because of the extended mandates covering uh, um, the occupied Palestinian territory and Israel proper, uh, and because of the geographical, uh, again, uh, sorry, the temporal mandate of the of the Commission of Inquiry that could possibly also address root causes, right? So they could even go back to history and to even the Nakba and even before the Nakba if they want to. Um, but I believe that what's lacking here, it's, it's the political will to hold Israel accountable. Um, when uh, Fatou Ben Souda, the former prosecutor of the ICC, actually asked the pretrial chamber if the ICC had jurisdiction into the situation of Palestine, we have seen many states arguing that the ICC had no jurisdictions in, in Palestine. And even reading through some of the um, written statements submitted by states in the ICJ case, we see that many states still oppose uh, uh, jurisdiction of international mechanism when it comes to all the Israel, Israel accountable. And I think that the difference uh, between what's happening now and, and previous round of hostilities in Gaza is that the international community set some standards uh, over the past two years when it comes to all the war criminals and alleged international, like perpetrators of alleged international crimes into accountable in other contexts, uh, uh, especially in Ukraine. And I think that there is a overall expectations that the same standards uh, are also applied uh, when it comes to the context of Israel and Palestine. And, you know, uh, while of course uh, the two situations are very, very different, uh, um, I think it's, it's clear that the response of the international community, and, and when I say the international community, I mostly refer to, to Western state, uh, and especially the United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union and its members. Uh, it's, it's very different when it comes to, again, Israeli violations or, or Russian violation. And again, I think that the key here, it's, it's the political will, right? So. Thank you. 
thanks, Julia uh, and Omar. Before we go on to a couple more questions on um, uh, a number of uh, other issues and, and before we take questions from, from people who might be watching, um, there is a discourse, especially in the West, uh, that allows for all these atrocities to take place uh, as though they are justified. And of course, it starts with the deadly attack of Hamas on October 7th. How have your organizations addressed uh, this uh, war, uh, including the uh, the October 7th uh, attack? And how, how do we make sense within a human rights framework of... Um, uh, the juxtaposition that's taking place with or without taking into account the decades of uh, context that is usually erased from the picture. So you're saying about the October 7th uh, attack itself? Yeah, yeah. And, and connection to uh, justifications for what is going on today. So this is more of a discursive uh, uh, point that addresses the way things are discussed in the West or in many parts of, uh, say, Europe and the United States. You want me to take this, Julian? I would like to hear both of your opinion. We can start with Omar. We can go back and forth. No, no, I mean, look, I mean, for, for, for Human Rights Watch, right, we, the, the law, international humanitarian law applies on to all parties, right? So even if, um, you know, even if one party does or does not have a justification to recourse to force, despite power imbalances, the same principles apply to everybody and no justification, nothing can justify the commission of a war crime or a crime against humanity by any party. So Human Rights Watch has been clear that deliberate killings of civilians, um, taking civilians as hostages, um, you know, that those are war crimes under international law and that there is no justification for them, just as those heinous acts cannot justify collective punishment of the entire population of Gaza or, you know, deliberately withholding humanitarian aid or indiscriminate unlawful um, airstrikes or the many other uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity that the Israeli government has carried out. So I think the principle is quite clear, um, just as, and same thing with indiscriminate attacks, whether it's, you know, the ones we've documented over the years that Israel has done in Gaza, or whether it's, you know, rockets indiscriminately fired at Israeli communities, it's the same legal prohibition. That is not to say that we're in a situation of equity between two equal parties. As Julia has noted, there's a clear context of, you know, Palestinians living a reality of apartheid and, and persecution. And there's a clear daily reality of structural violence and repression Palestinians face. That doesn't justify uh, violations of international humanitarian law, but, but you can't sort of say those points uh, in a way that suggests that we're dealing in a, a situation of two equal parties committing abuses. There is a power imbalance. Uh, despite that power imbalance, violations of international humanitarian law um, when they're committed, are not justified, they're war crimes, the perpetrators should be held accountable. Thanks, Julia. Um, so I think that in every, the first thing that a good international law professor will tell to his, his or her class on the very first day is that we need to distinguish between use ad bellum and use in bello. So the set of rules that regulate the uh, right to use force and the set of rules that regulates the way that force has been has been used. Um, well, Palestinian human rights organizations have many times uh, hold the well have a clear position, which is that the right to self defense cannot be invoked when uh, the threat comes from an occupied territory. Uh, so in this case, we, we don't believe that Israel has legitimate cli claim to, to self-defense under, under international law. But that apart, um, as Omar was saying, um, whatever are the reasons behind the use of force, uh, uh, international humanitarian law binds all parties to, to the conflict equally. Um, however, I mean, we are in a situation where Israel is also the occupying power in Gaza. And that, of course, uh, uh, places on Israel additional uh, obligations under the fourth Geneva Convention vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the occupied population in, in Gaza. 
Thank you. I think I, for some reason, I... Hmm. Sorry, uh, I think for some reason I kicked you guys out. And you didn't like one, my answer this time. That's good. That's okay. This, this doesn't work without you. I don't uh, understand what is going on right now. All right. In all cases, um, let me uh, let me also uh, uh, move to a another question, and that is. Uh, the 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 idea the the question of public knowledge uh, and public opinion uh, to what extent these matter in human rights advocacy? I can start. Gradually, please. No, no, please, you, you, please. <laughs> Sorry. So look, I mean, I think it matters, Bassem, because as Julia noted, like it's political will that's often lacking. I mean, I've briefed so many governments around our the apartheid findings of, of human rights organizations, the consensus in the human rights movement. And behind closed doors, many governments, including in prominent European and U.S. capitals, have told me behind closed doors, look, I agree with your analysis. I know we need to do more, but there's this or that political constraint. And so, you know, public opinion uh, can be significant, especially when it's used strategically to, um, you know, push governments to take stronger action. I mean, we're seeing, we've seen what's happened in the United States, where the Biden administration's shameful language and positions on Israel-Palestine in recent days, but obviously in, in, in months and years, has sometimes created pushback from within parts of the Democratic Party in different areas, and that has created a type of pressure that sometimes led the U.S. to do a little bit more than, um, you know, than, 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 than usual, still obviously woefully insufficient. So, um, you know, the, rea the reality is international law um, processes should be ones that are legal and that take place, um, you know, on the merits. But as, you know, Noura Arafat in her book has, has laid out, often it is, you know, these are institutions for which political mobilizations and strategies are so critical to moving things forward. So it's important that space is created for the prosecutor at the ICC and for the ICJ and for other, you know, legal bodies and states. Um, they should be making determinations based on the facts that are documented, the legal violations that are clearly documented. They should be recognizing it and they should be taking steps to end complicity in them. But the reality in the world we live in today is that public opinion and political mobilization matters. They shouldn't matter on judicial institutions. They should be allowed to operate the way they are. But when it comes to decisions by, by states, I think having voices come from public, from the public, from political parties, from uh, think tanks, from institutions, I think it's critically important. Um, can we uh, move to Julia? Yes. Um, well, I, I believe that in the context of Palestine, um, public awareness, it's, it's key. Um, and the way public opinion addresses the issue, it's key. I think that for, for many, many years, uh, um, everyone has been, you know, labeling the, the question of Palestine as very complex, uh, too hard to understand. Um, but I think that, you know, the work of, of human rights organizations have helped to make it somehow clearer, right? So even the whole idea of, uh, of referring to to the situation in, in Israel Palestine as apartheid, I think it I think it makes you know it, it's clear, right? So there is one group that oppresses the other one, um, and I think that over the past few few weeks, um, many many Palestinians have been highly disappointed by by the reaction of of governments, especially um, in the West, uh, and again as I said before, especially in, in the UK in the US and, and in many in many European states. And I think that, for instance, you know, seeing images of half a million people taking the streets in London to, to show solidarity with, with Palestinians, despite the, the shameful position of the UK government and the UK opposition party, it's a sign of hope for, for 2 million Palestinians in Gaza now that are literally been living 20, 
three consecutive days under Israeli bombs and starving and basically being dehydrated. Uh, and the same when, you know, they see pictures of uh, Jewish activists uh, um, doing a stand up in Central Station in New York, right? Those are all signs that the public is, you know, growing, uh, um, the, the, aware, the awareness between the public, it's, it's growing and um, it's just fair because the, the images that are coming out of Gaza are something that should horrify anyone that sees them. And I'm sure that they will hunt humanities for, for decades to come. Uh, and I think that it's important that if, again, for Palestinians, it's really important to, to, to see any acts of, of solidarities uh, and also the idea that perhaps one day this government will actually hear um, what their people in the streets are saying. Sorry about this. Um, so let me uh, let me also move to another question about uh, potential ramifications and the idea of or the uh, potential of uh, investigation, specifically of the uh, crimes being committed in Gaza for now more than three weeks, uh, unabated, and it is it is uh, said that we're not yet in the most difficult and probably costly uh, part of the assault. In this context, uh, if there's an investigation uh, on, on these, uh, of these uh, crimes, what evidence may be used to substantiate uh, these violations? I mean, we see everything on television, uh, but how do human rights organizations uh, substantiate these uh, human rights violations and uh, how binding ultimately will this be? Or is it a matter of time whereby right now there is a clear insistence that, quote unquote, this is justified and the, any uh, statements by the United States specifically uh, gives the, give the impression that uh, there is, you know, just short of a complete carte blanche, if not a total carte blanche. Is it a matter of time when these matters will be investigated? And uh, also, let's 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 go with Omar and. and... Okay. Um, no, I was just going to say. Um, look, these investigations are um, even when what you see on TV is is as jarring as can be. Doing an international humanitarian law investigation is challenging, right? Because um, it requires you know on the ground work in many cases. Often, in, in, you know, it's very it's possible, but more difficult without on the ground access. And I'm sure, as Julia will tell us, human rights workers, including her colleagues on the ground in Mizan, are fighting for their own survival. I mean, there there's no safe place to go in Gaza. They're under continuous bombardment. Many of our colleagues in Palestinian human rights organizations have lost. Um, family in Gaza. Um, you know, uh, we've had the homes of several prominent human rights advocates destroyed. They're also trying to feed their families and find clean water. And uh, so, you know, uh, in the current context, that makes it even more challenging. And that's, you know, foreign human rights organizations, our challenges pale in comparison, but the Israeli government hasn't allowed us access you know, via uh, its crossings one time since 2008. That includes the ability for us to send our munitions experts and others to be able to do the kinds of assessments. Also, the Israeli government has provided next to no transparency about, you know, what, what, what on what basis, you know, it's, it's striking uh, in the way it's doing with thousands of bombs and densely populated areas. So um, the way we do our investigations um, is, you know, we, we do we interview victims, we try and corroborate accounts. We use open source. So currently we're using satellite imagery as part of our investigation. We try and verify video footage that becomes available from on the ground accounts. We speak to victims. We uh, document the facts. We apply the law and we make determinations. We've done that through every round of escalation that's happened in Gaza. We'll do that during you know this particular escalation despite uh, the challenges. Now, human rights things we have. We've been finding war crimes and grave abuses and crimes against humanity for weeks, year, months, years, decades, right, in some cases. And um, but ultimately, obviously, that needs to be acted on by judicial bodies and by states. And that's where it, that's been lacking, obviously. So um, 
you know, there, uh, there are steps by which the court itself, the International Criminal Court, can investigate. It has an investigation. Uh, it can collect information, make its own determinations. Uh, the prosecutor, when he was in Egypt, declared that he was trying to enter Gaza uh, and Israel precisely to do that. Um, and, you know, obviously access has not been forthcoming as it's not been forthcoming for other UN investigators and others. Um, and uh, yeah, whether or not it leads to accountability is a, you know, is, is, is the million dollar question. Unfortunately, far too often the international community, not just with Palestinians, I should note, with many other grave situations uh, of human rights abuse uh, around the world have failed to rise to the occasion. And it's all, it's, it's, it's always important. And in many cases, whether or not it does so in, the, in this particular context is really a test of the of international legal system and of the commitment of states to uphold impartial justice and accountability for all. Julia, if you may, if you will. Yeah. Um, so because of the of the gravity of, of the situation on the ground, this is it's the first time in Al Mizan 24 year history that we are basically unable to to operate and to collect evidences and, and documentation from from the ground. Um, many of my colleagues have, have been displaced more than once. Uh, many of them have evacuated in the, in the south of Gaza. Um, many of them have, have lost family members. So that clearly um, had an impact on, on the way we, we conduct our, our work, that it's usually grounded in, again, field work and, and field documentation. Um, I believe that this is not just the case for Al Mizan, but it's the case for, for many other Palestinian organizations, including the Palestinian Center for Human Rights and Al Haq. Uh, we have basically been almost unable to collect evidences and documentation since the 13th of, of October. And we have made it uh, clear to international accountability mechanism with whom our organizations regularly um, interact and to which we have provided evidences for, for the past decade. Um, and of course, this will, have a, the, this will have a major impact, but as Omar was saying that there are other ways to um, conduct investigations, including through the use of open source um, satellite images, and not to mention that um, we are also looking into violations of third states and possibly businesses involved uh, into the crimes that are currently being committed in, in Gaza and in the West Bank. So we are also, again, uh, assessing to, to, to take uh, action against, for instance, uh, companies that are supplying Israel with weapons that are then used to commit crimes in, uh, in Gaza. Um, even if in general, I would say that there are some crimes, uh, um, for instance, I'm thinking about the, the imposition of a closure um, and the total siege on Gaza that doesn't really need much of evidences. <laughs> um, it's, it's just there. Um, I would just want to say that uh, while, for instance, we, well, you know, we, we of course welcome the the visit of the ICC prosecutor to, to Rafa crossing. Um, however, um, of course, we are disappointed that he is still, he and his investigation team are not being granted access into, into Gaza or uh, into, into the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. And as Amar was saying, this is also the case for other accountability mechanisms, including, for instance, the UN Special Rapporteur on the on the human rights situation in the occupied Palestinian territory, but also the, the UN Commission of Inquiry into the, into the OPT and, and Israel. Um, this uh, situation on the ground, it's also coupled to the fact that, I mean, there are basically no foreign journalists in Gaza uh, that have been blackouts uh, over the past three weeks. Um, like over the weekend, uh, we didn't hear from, from people in Gaza for, I think, 36 hours. Of course, that's all part and parcels of, you know, this idea that crimes can be committed and no one will be actually able to, to collect evidences and documentation to, uh, to prove that they are being committed. And, and this is something that I think feeds into the idea that Israel has been giving, as we were saying, like a 
carte blanche to commit whatever whatever they want in Gaza under the the under the excuse of of self defense. One last question, and I know that I've kept you for quite some time here uh, at Gaza in Context, uh, the, the collaborative series with, with um, almost two dozen institutions. Um, we, we will be holding other um, teachings going forward, uh, and we will be uh, hopefully um, uh, speaking with uh, like the broadest array on, on a various, of people on a various uh, topics. And I hope we don't have to bring you back because that would be that would mean that this is lasting longer and longer. But one last question, uh, and that is a question from um, YouTube, actually, and uh, it basically says: If Israel is not held to account, what sort of precedent does this set for global human rights or in Palestine, in particular, in the future? And will Israel? move to commit similar actions in the West Bank or the or elsewhere? Um, well, I mean, I think it's clear that impunity fuels more impunity and more violence, right? Um, we are like, what we've been seeing in Gaza, of course, now it's at a scale that it's unprecedented, but uh, it's, you know, it's not something completely new. Uh, we have been seeing policies of targeting civ like family homes and indiscriminately targeting civilians and civilian objects in all past rounds of hostilities. Uh, even in May this year, um, when there was a short round of hostilities among uh, in Gaza, uh, in 2014, in 51 days, Israel killed over 2,000 Palestinians. No one has ever been held accountable. Of course, the fact that past violations uh, have never been accounted for fuel current violations. Um, and I think that um, the, the, the case of Palestine will be uh, would be crucial in in maintaining the credibility of the international criminal court as well as other internationally international accountability mechanism right um because it, again the scale of violations that we're seeing on the ground it's to such a scale that like humanity as a whole cannot allow them to be unaccounted for um and i believe that when western <coughs> countries um do not you know do not hold israel to the same standards as they hold other countries they give a clear sign to these countries um i remember that in september at the un general assembly the russian foreign minister uh used uh, um a quote from secretary blinken uh basically the quote from blinken was kind of justifying the occupation of the Syrian Golan by Israel because of Israel's security concern. And basically the Russian foreign minister took the same quote, but swapped the words Donbass and, and, and Russia with Golan and Israel, right? So here, like whatever happens in, in Gaza in the forthcoming weeks and months and the way the international community will react to to the crimes that are being committed will set a precedent for 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 decades to come. Yeah, I mean, I, not much to add. I think Julia Julia said it, um, you know, very well, right? I mean, um, Human Rights Watch, you know, when you know we've supported many important initiatives at the Human Rights Council around accountability, around uh, complic ending complicity in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And one thing our advocates in Geneva and New York tell us is the difficulty that, you know, even that the United States and other countries have of getting countries like South Africa and others and Latin America and, and Africa to join their initiatives in Asia is that they feel like there are clear double standards. And there is just no question that, I mean, it's not even dis debatable, right? The very same principles that apply legally to Israel's activities in the occupied Palestinian territories are some of the very same principles that are being used in 
uh, you know, uh, Ukraine when it comes to the rules of international humanitarian law, when it comes to situations of occupation. Uh, all these same principles are the ones being raised here. And um, it not only hurts civilians on the ground when these principles are disregarded, but it undermines the very international legal system that Europe has sought to defend in the context of Ukraine. So it's not only a matter of lives at stake in Israel, Palestine and beyond, but it's actually the very legal principles that are, um, you know, that are important. I mean, it's important to understand that international humanitarian law, this is not a deal between uh, parties to an armed conflict. It's a deal with humanity. And so when humanity disregards these basic principles, it is, it, it is undermining the system that has sought to prevent atrocities in the, in the aftermath of the horrors of what happened in World War II. And that is the very system and the very principles that are being methodically not just undermined, but being entirely disregarded, destroyed and thrown in the garbage bin when it comes to Gaza. And the ramifications of doing that will be felt far beyond Israel, Palestine. And I'm, I'm afraid for years and to come, it's not too late. Um, you know, the, you know, there's a chance to prevent further large scale atrocities, but the window to act is rapidly closing. Thank you both so much. I, I just can't help but throw out this idea that, uh, you know, those of us who have been around for some time, including in the 80s with the, uh, the, the situation in apartheid South Africa, for instance, and many other sorts of uh, systemic uh, uh, racism and uh, subjugation, uh, it, how consistent is Israel in dismissing everything that human rights organizations do or say uh, how consistent is it with, with prior uh, states that have engaged in either crimes against humanity uh, or uh, in actual systems that have uh, somehow, you know, uh, uh, unbelievably, I suppose, lasted for decades and decades uh, with, uh, with impunity? Is is uh, are, are we uh, is this now a, a norm whereby uh, an actual system of discrimination and apartheid and ethnic cleansing and uh, all of the um, policies, the active policies that even precede this this assault, uh, is this something that, uh, uh, in your view, is um, uh, is 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 being curtailed, or is it is it a new world where uh, might makes right is is essentially the uh, the status quo again, as usual. Do we ha is there any hope that uh, there is uh, some sort of a uh, standard by which uh, these uh, violations? Uh, will be actually increasingly curtailed in the future? I think okay. that what Julia started with is, is really what I would say. I mean, it's not unique to Israel Palestine. Anywhere in the world where there is impunity, you will continue to see the same abuses happen and escalating. I mean, I used to cover Egypt for Human Rights Watch, mm -hmm. and we warned, right, um, you know, that if there's no accountability for the Rabah massacre, that would be a green light for the continuation of, um, you know, shutting down of dissent in Egypt. And certainly that's been the script of the last decade. It's a universal norm everywhere, right? You know, um, no accountability in the United States for uh, torture and arbitrary arrest post 9-11. Trump comes to power and threatens many of these same, you know, principles. It's, it's, it's universal, right? If, you're, if, you, if you cannot ensure that um, there is meaningful consequences to those who perpetrate um, serious grave international crimes, then it's they're bound to repeat. So I, I do think, um, you know, I, I absolutely do think that might, as you put it, might uh, overwrite is the reality of what we're seeing all too often, unfortunately. And the, the longer it allows, it's allowed to persist, the more uh, civilians will continue to pay the price in Israel, Palestine, and beyond. Julia, any last words? No, I mean, my, my assessment, it's, it's very similar. Um, before working on Palestine, I worked on the issue of migration flows into, into Europe. And I mean, this summer, thousands of people died drawing in the Mediterranean. And that's because also because no one has ever been held accountable for, for past mass uh, 
killings of uh, of migrants or the lack of I, I mean as i said before the the lack of accountability um and impunity will only fuel impunity and i think that the the reverberation of of Israel's impunity will be heard uh, not only throughout times, but also in many, many other parts of, of the world. Because as Omar was mentioning before, there are many countries uh, that are questioning, you know, withdrawing from their own statute uh, or even not cooperating with the court when it comes to other situation, because they believe that the international justice system, it's failing them because of its, of its double standard. So, it's uh i mean i hate when people say that palestine is the litmus litmus test for for international law but but it is true um it, it is and um and i think that the, like the international community and humanity bear responsibility towards any victim of of mass and mass atrocities and grave human rights violations and every victim has the same right to 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 seek and receive justice Thank you. Thank you both uh, very much. Uh, I uh, know that there are many other questions and concerns, uh, especially uh, regarding the ongoing uh, literal, literal slaughter that is taking place uh, that is very um, uh, uh, it's almost like a uh, a Hollywood set and the pictures that are coming out from Jabalia today uh, are the sorts of things that uh, uh, only special effects can render had, mm -hmm. had this not actually happened. And this is on a daily basis, which is why we are having this teaching. Um, and we all understand that there are other problems and atrocities in the world, but this is what we are watching and looking at every day these days. Um, thank you for all your work. Uh, I would like to uh, keep in touch. We would like to keep in touch with you. Uh, let me just say that uh, all of the teachings that have uh, been produced already, uh, this is uh, uh, basically our uh, third, and they will all be available on palestineandcontext.org as well as a number of other resources that will be increasingly offered there on uh, the same website, palestineandcontext.org. And uh, we will also be adding uh, various resources uh, for researchers, educators, uh, lay persons, and so on. Uh, and uh, we will be continuing this week with another uh, teach in on uh, Gaza and geography, which will take place on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And this will also be on palestinecontext.org when it comes out, as well as on the um, various websites of our uh, co sponsors and co organizers, which I would like to share uh, their names very quickly. And uh, just to make sure everyone is aware of the breadth of this effort. Uh, it's the Arab Studies Institute, Georgetown University Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, George Mason University's Middle East and Islamic Studies Program, Rutgers Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Bir Zayt uh, University Museum, Harvard Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Brown University Center for Middle East Studies, University of Chicago's Center for Contemporary Theory, Brown University's New Directions in Palestine, Palestinian Studies, Georgetown University Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, Simon Fraser University Center for Comparative Muslim Studies, Georgetown University Qatar, American University in Cairo, Alternative Policy Studies, Middle East Studies Global Academy, um, University of Chicago's Center for Middle Eastern Studies, CUNY's Middle East and Middle Eastern American Center, um, George Mason University's Center for Global Islamic Studies, University of Illinois Chicago's Arab American Cultural Center, George Washington's Institute for Middle East Studies. And we were just joined uh, recently by 
the Kevorkian Center at the New York University, at New York University. So um, I'm sorry this was long. Maybe I should have let you guys go to do your better work before I read this. I apologize. But thank you again for joining us, Julia and Omar. Uh, we can't thank you enough for the work you're doing. And we sincerely hope we don't invite you back too soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.